Before we go any farther today, I think we would be remiss, or I would, maybe you feel the same way, if we didn't stop for just a moment and, 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 and worship him for what he's done. Come on, you just lift up your hands and your heart. If he hasn't done anything for you today, look back at what he has done for you. Can we just love on him a moment? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, today. Oh, I bless you, Jesus. How wonderful it is to know, Lord, we can trust you. Oh, I thank you, Lord, for proving it time after time. God, I bless you today. Hallelujah to you. How wonderful it is to know, Lord, your word is true. Your promises always are fulfilled. We bless you, Jesus. We honor you in this place. God, we remember what you have done. We bless you, Lord, for all those things you have brought to pass. God, we worship you. We honor you today. Hallelujah to your name. Amen. God's good. And he's worthy of our praise. Amen. Praise God. Well, Happy New Year. It's good to be in God's house, isn't it? Thank you so much for being here today. I want you to turn with me as we start a new series this morning that will carry us through the month of January. I want you to turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28. Is where we will be today. I want us to read it together, if we will, if you will. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know the rulers, that the rulers of the Gentiles or the world lord it over you, or and those who are great exercise authority over you. He said, it shouldn't be that way among you. In fact, I don't want it to be that way. That's not my style, if you will. That's not my pattern of leadership. That's not, as believers, the way you should think about authority and leadership. It's not how you should think about greatness shall not be that way among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. In these few verses, Jesus establishes a paradigm of leadership that is flipped on its head, if you will, from what most of the world operates in. The style of leadership that thinks that the more authority you have, the more blessings you should receive. The more authority and position that you have, the more people should serve you. The style of authority that says the more power and responsibility or authority you have, everybody should do what you want. That's what we see present most in the world, right? Jesus flips that on its head here and he says that the, the style of leadership or the the impetus of greatness, the pursuit of greatness, according to my standard, is that the higher you grow in authority, the higher you grow in position, the more you give, the more you cover, the more you bless others, the more you look for opportunities to give to those under you. 
It's a completely different paradigm. It's a com completely different mindset. I want you to notice something here, that God or, or Christ does not say don't desire to be great. In fact, he encourages greatness. How many believes and knows God is great? Yeah. Huh? He is the highest standard of greatness. And he doesn't say, settle for mediocrity. In fact, he encourages every believer to pursue the highest of highs in their morality, in their, in their condition of their heart, as Jimbo talked about, in, in the standard in which they live, and even in the positions that they hold. God desires for us to pursue greatness. He wants us, and Peter said it that best. He said, whatever you put your hands to do, come on, help me out, do it with all of your might as unto the Lord. So I want to put to death the notion that Christianity pushes us to mediocrity. That's totally opposite of what we read in Scripture. Christianity pushes us to greatness, to be all that God intended for us to be. However, God's definition of greatness looks much different than this world's. Amen. Amen. His definition compels us to serve, to give, to look for opportunities to bless instead of always wanting to be blessed. Wow. So today, starting January 7th, 2024, this new year, God has put in my spirit this one word. Jimbo had his word, I have my word today, that I believe God has put in my spirit for Isaiah City Church of God, not just for this year, but maybe moving forward for many years to come. And that one word is serve. 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 Becoming great in God. Becoming great or being great for God requires humble service. And we'll say that again and then we're going to pray. Being great for God requires humble service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I bless you today. I thank you, Lord, for the spirit of the Lord that's so mighty in this place. I'm so grateful for the people, Lord, that you have ministered to and lifted up and encouraged. Thank you, Lord, for those that have embraced who you are and, and have trusted you with their situation and trusted you in their life. God, that you're going to bring them through, that, God, you're going to uh, see your will come to pass in their life. God, I thank you, Lord, for what you've already done, what you've already spoken. Now, God, I ask you to prepare our hearts. God, I thank you, Lord, because you have positioned us to be great in your kingdom. God, you have positioned us as a church and as individuals, Lord, to see great things come to pass, things that we only could dream about. I know that because I believe in the heart of your people. Lord, I've watched them and I've seen their passion. And God, I believe you've positioned us as a body for things that we've never seen before, both the revelation of your spirit, but God, also the impact in this community. And God, I pray that today would be a confirmation of, of that in each person's heart. I pray, Lord, that it will be settled in our spirit today, that you desire greatness for us. Lord, you desire greatness through us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for what you're about to speak and what more importantly, what you're about to do in and through our lives. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Now, it's my desire today that this is not a motivational message. In fact, I don't believe God put it in my heart uh, for it to be a motivational me message. 
I believe it's a message of confirmation because I've been able to watch many of you, especially toward the latter part of 2023, but all throughout last year, been able to watch as God has cultivated a, a passion for giving and a passion for serving. Just toward the end of last year, we saw God do some incredible stuff, right? Amen. Right? Right? Through our big give, reaching places we've never reached before, through the coat drive that all, many of you gave in abundance to, just over and over, one thing after another that, that you guys gave yourself to, you, you invested money in. I believe you and I have, have got to that place where God has put inside of us a passion and a drive to, to bless other people. Am I right? It's more than just something we're doing. Now it's kind of something we, we, we love to do and anticipate doing. A am I right? Yeah. So today, I believe God has put this in my spirit, again, not as a motivation for you to do those things, but as a confirmation that God is doing great things through us, and he's going to continue yeah. as long as you and I continue serving. Amen? Amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say this. Say, I'm going to serve. Oh, that was weak. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm going to serve. How about you? Amen. Amen. All right, now y'all had to pray for your pastor. Y'all ready to stretch, just stretch your hands this way? I'm trying something new today. Uh, I got some new glasses on so I don't have to take them on and off. Uh, they're, they're, they're bifocals. So uh, I ain't figured out, you know, how to use them yet. And I've been told, don't step down. Uh, Y'all know I ain't staying on this stage the whole service, right? So y'all pray to God to remind me to take these things off before I come down. Will y'all do that? Some of y'all pray the Lord will never forget so he fall. I rebuke that spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen. We talk a lot about culture around here, the culture of Isaiah City. Culture is basically who we are, right? It's the environment that we work hard to create. It's the way we pursue things, the mindset in which we pursue. It's the, the mindset in which uh, we hope we are cultivating in the next generation. Culture is basically identity. Well, I want to say this. From what I can understand through Scripture and specifically through the life of Christ, caring and serving is the culture of the gospel. Caring and serving is the culture of the gospel. If the gospel has an identity... If the gospel wants to create any mindset in the world, it is God cares for us, and he came to serve us. Amen. Amen. Service to the point where he led us out of darkness into freedom. Yes. Caring and serving is the culture of the gospel. But, but I want you to know, what I've researched and what I see is that to serve well, you and I must embrace a very difficult word. And that word is humility. To serve well, you must embrace humility. And that's a word, the reason why I say that's a tough word, in certain instances of our life, humility is easy. It just kind of flows. But then there's other areas of our life where we may struggle a little bit. I, someone made the statement, I've said it here many times, but it, it bears repeating today. How do you know if you're a servant or not? You know you're a servant if you still serve after people treat you like a servant. I'm going to say that again. Did you hear what I just said? You know you're a servant if you continue to serve even when people treat you like a servant. That is when humility is hard. 
But to serve well, you and I must not only exercise humility when it's easy, but when it's hard. In fact, we've got to embrace it. So if we've got to embrace humility, what, what actually does humility mean? Okay? Now, some of this is my own my own definitions based upon my understanding of Scripture. Some of it is straight from the Word. But, but, so I'm going to give you what, what I believe humility is, what, what it is. Okay, you ready? Humility is this. It is understanding and respecting position, purpose, and value of people in different places in life. I'm going to say that again. Understanding and respecting position, purpose, and value of people in different places in life. What do I mean by that? We have a tendency to respect certain positions, elevate certain people, right? And look at others in a little bit different way, right? Based upon profession, based upon income, based upon background, based upon how they dress. We have a tendency, if we're not careful, to elevate and lower. Elevate and lower. What this does is it takes all of that out of the equation. We don't look at people from what they present on the outward. We value people for how God created them. And we value them based upon the role that God has called them to fulfill. For example, it's not wrong to walk into a doctor's office when you're in need of medical attention and humble yourself to their opinion. Right? Right? Because they've studied, hopefully, they've studied, they've prepared, they have more expertise most of the time than, than you do. And when they speak, hopefully, hopefully you can trust that they're trying to give you a good answer to solve your medical problem, right? Come on, help me out. So you can walk in and humble yourself to their expertise and their intelligence. Okay? Well, what about the plumber? When the plumber comes to your house. No, he didn't necessarily go to school for eight years. No, he don't have the ability to, to perform surgery on you. No, he, he ain't charging you some, well, yeah, he is. Plumbers charge a lot too. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Is it also okay in that moment to treat the plumber with the same level of humility that you treated, treated the doctor? Huh? Yeah. By your attitude toward him, by, by your language, yeah. the way you treat him yeah. and respect his profession. Yeah. You get where I'm going with this. Yeah. Humility says everybody has their station in life, everybody has their gifts, everybody has their abilities, and God has ordained people to fill certain spots and if they're fulfilling those spots with integrity, we ought to honor them, especially if they are, God is using them to, to do something of importance in our life. We ought to submit and honor them in humility as one in that moment that is over, the, over me. If I'm calling a plumber, it means I can't fix my pipes. You with me now? Therefore, in that moment... He's over me, and I should humble myself to his expertise and his ability. And what humility says is I understand and I respect position, purpose, and value of people in different places of life. When we walk into certain arenas because we think we all that and we treat people with disrespect, when we talk down to them because they don't make as much money as we do, 
or they're not in positions of authority like we do, you and I then have pushed off humility, and you and I at that moment in time, we lose, look at me now, we lose the opportunity to serve them. And we lose the opportunity in the eyes of God to be great. Woo! Humility says every place I go, I'm looking for purpose, position, and value. And I'm going to honor that person based upon those things. And, I, and I'm going to treat them with honor and respect in those moments. So that it opens the door, the possibility of 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 serving them and, 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 and touching them for Christ. I love this statement. Jesus moved effortlessly between the powerful and the powerless, showing genuine love and care to each. Ooh, I love that statement. Jesus could talk to Nicodemus, the most powerful Pharisee, and show genuine love and concern and care and speak candidly to him. And he could go to the leper that, that was cast out and stretch his hand toward him and lift that joker up and change his life forever. And he did that throughout Scripture over and over. He goes from one environment, going from the Jairus, a leader in the community, to the woman with the issue of blood, all in the same scene. He flowed from the powerless or the powerful to the powerless, and, but he, didn't, he never changed. He looked at every one of them and said, just because you have a position or you don't doesn't mean you have less value and less purpose. Amen. He flowed effortlessly, effortlessly from the powerful to the powerless, and that's what he wants us to do. But we have a tendency, don't we? Um, we have a tendency. To categorize people. And based upon those categories of our life is how we treat people. Just ask, just ask a waitress or a waiter what the worst day of the week is. You know what? Almost 100% of the time what they'll tell you? Sunday. Because church folks are coming in the door. And church folks are the most demanding and they're the worst tippers. I'm preaching now. It ain't got quiet. And y'all looking at me like, Pastor Brett, that's meddling. That ain't preaching. No, that is exactly what I'm talking about. Humility says, I'm going to treat you. You're serving me today. You're over me. You're carrying my food out. I've always been taught that you treat the person who's cooking and serving your food with great respect. Amen. Am I right? Because there's some places between the kitchen and my table that I can't see. Come on now. Jesus moved effortlessly between those two places. Wow. What else does humility mean? Oh, humility is the determined mindset to obey. Determined mindset to obey. Say it with me. Determined mindset to obey. Ooh. Did you notice I didn't say oh, humility is obedience? No. I said humility is the determined mindset. That even before the question is asked, even before God gives us his will, we have already determined obedience. Wow. Now that's a whole nother level. Two examples I give you real quick. Widow of Zarephath, y'all know the story. She walks in, or Elijah the prophet walks in to her city. She is on her last leg. She's exhausted everything. She's about to die, her and her son. She's about to cook the very last biscuit in the meal. Uh, and, and she is already determined in her head that she and her son are going to pass away after they eat. They're going to lay in their house and just die of starvation. Can you imagine that mindset? 
Here, here comes the man of God into the city. She meets him, or he encounters her, and he said, woman, go back to your house, cook me a biscuit first, and then cook something for you and your son. <laughs> this story makes me laugh every time because I, I think about what in the world would I have done in that moment if a, if a preacher would have asked me to do the same thing. I ain't going to go there. But she obeyed. Y'all know the story, right? The Bible says she went and cooked Elijah a biscuit, and, and because she obeyed, because she had a determined mindset to obey, that her, that her cruise of oil never ran dry, and her biscuit meal never was empty. She made it through the entire famine. God took care of her and her family and the prophet, and everybody saw the hand of God through her life. Humility is when you and I have a determined mindset to obey, even when it don't make sense. And even when it's hard. Mm. Y'all know that was hard, right? Y'all know she went back to her kitchen. Lord, gee, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I like that Elijah. He was, yeah, but I'm going to make this biscuit for him. I think of some of the comments that might have been coming out this room. If I showed up at your house for your last dollar, and I said, go buy me something first, and then, mm. never mind. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, going through all the agony that he went through. Y'all know the prayer. Father, if there's another way, man, if there's another way to do this, then, then I, I know what we talked about. I know the plan we put together from eternity. I understand, but my body's feeling this. My body is racked with pain. My body is feeling the weight of this world's sin. Lord, I don't, I don't know if I can go through this, Father, but nevertheless, if this is your will, I'm doing it. That's humility. That's surrender. That's submissiveness. That's a determined mindset that, that, that God can work with to do great things. Amen. Amen. And I want to say this to you. I want to read this to you. It's a little lengthy, but I want you to read, uh, see this. Can we throw it up there? The next one, it says this. God always responds to his seat of authority with the proper care, the proper protection, the proper provision, and the proper guidance. Therefore, it is always right, and it is always best to obey him and serve him. You can never point back to a time when God sat in his seat of authority, when he, in his place of greatness, and didn't, and didn't take care of those that were under him. You can never point to a time where God sat in the seat of his authority in the throne of heaven and not have mercy on those that were under him. You can never point to a time where God sat in the throne of heaven and when people asked him for guidance, he didn't open up the pathway for them to know his will. God always responds to his authority with the right mindset, with the right heart, and with the right provision. Therefore, look at me, y'all. When God speaks, we ought to obey. Amen. We should respond immediately because there's never been a time when God has acted selfishly against you and I. Even though, look at me now, don't miss this, even though he is God Almighty, even though he deserves our praise, even though he deserves our sacrifice, every time I turn around, God is sacrificing for me. Every time I turn around, God's giving me what I don't deserve. Can I get an amen from anybody? Is that not true? Therefore, I know, Brother Scott, I know that if God asks me to do something, if there's a command that he puts into my life, there ought to be a direct and a determined mindset to obey it because God has never asked something of me that is selfish. Amen. 
He has always asked something or those things of me to carry me to a different place, to provide for me at a different level, to open a doorway for me to see things I've never seen before. He has always responded rightly in his seat of authority. Do you understand what I said? And humility says, because I can trust that, I'm going to have a determined mindset to obey. Woo. And then the last thing. Humility means there is a desire and a willingness to give. Say it with me. A desire and a willingness to give. Why did I say that in that way? How many of those people can give without a desire? That word purity, that great exposition that Jimbo gave us earlier. Our tithe and our offering don't move God unless it comes from here. Amen. You and I can give in a thousand offerings, but if it don't come from here, can I tell you, it don't impress God. In fact, it don't mean nothing to him. But the moment you and I say, God, I give because I want to, I give because I want to bless you. I give, God, because you've been so good to me, and I want to give back to you. The moment our heart responds to God and it compels us to give, that is what moves the heart of God. Desire and willingness to give is a true act of humility. It says, and I want you to see, Jesus didn't show his love by a lecture. He showed us his love by his giving. For God so loved that he did what? What did he do, Lucas? He gave, right? He gave. He didn't stand in heaven and say, you ought to give. He didn't stand on the throne room of heaven and say, y'all ought to do this. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ gave. He didn't show us love by a lecture. He showed us love by giving. He showed us love by serving. Come on, somebody. What we have a tendency, if we ain't careful as Christians, is we constantly go around in our our, uh, high holiness, in our self-righteousness, and spouting out lectures about the greatness of God and how how the filth of the world and and how bad people are. Come on. Y'all do know those lectures... Don't change a whole lot if it's not mixed with a heart to serve. The moment you and I mix God's word with an example in front of the world by serving and giving is when God mixes the two and he stirs the pot of effectiveness. He makes it taste good to the world because they ain't only hearing it, but they seeing it. They ain't only hearing it, but they feeling it. They got a living, breathing example in front of them that says, God, man, they, God must have really done something in, in this dude's life for him to go from where he was to now all he wants to do is give and serve and bless. That, that God he talks about must be real. Uh, come on, musicians. I'm almost done. So humility is this. What is Humility. It is a desire and a willingness to give. But what does giving look like? Ooh, y'all ready? Are you ready? Come on, I'm going to ask them one more time. I'm going to give everybody a chance one more time. Are you ready? Good deal. What does giving look, by, look like? It is having the mindset that we're never too big to do things others won't. Never too big to do things others won't. Jesus gave us an example. He's about to go to the cross. Of all the times, look at me, y'all, please don't miss this. Of all the times his disciples ought to have been coming around him and serving him. Of all the times that Jesus should have had people surrounding him, praying for him, encouraging him, lifting him up. And what do we see? They jockey in for position. But it didn't affect Jesus. He calls them together. 
He sits at the table. And when he got through eating, he gets up from the table, derobes, and puts on a, table, a towel and goes washes every one of those disciples' feet, including Judas. Now, how many of y'all, knowing Judas would betray you, would wash his feet? Y'all crazy if you do. That's a special kind of love. I got a, another story real quick. Y'all, it, it's a story of this young uh, Filipino doctor who was a believer. And he chose the profession under the leading of the Lord and because he wanted to make an impact. He wanted to show the love of the Lord. And he was pretty good at, at science. So he went into the medical, medical profession and became a doctor. And he was at this hospital the first day, first day on the job. Lowest doctor on the totem pole, and they're making the rounds. He comes upon this room of this uh, elderly lady, probably in her mid-80s, and she's curled up in the bed in agonizing pain. And he asks, what's wrong with this lady? What's going on with this lady? And, And the nurses and the doctors said she is facing extreme constipation. Her bowels have not moved in quite a while. And one of the old, older doctors looks at the others and after they have tried everything imaginable to, to fix the problem, and he, and he looks at him and he said, it's time. And then they laugh. Because what they said was time, it was manual evacuation of the bowels. If you don't know what that means, it means somebody's got to go in there, up in there and unclog them. And I say, they laughed and they said, it's your turn. Looking at this young Filipino doctor. And they left and went and got breakfast. And he said, I've never heard of this. I've never done this before. And he said, well, the nurses can do it. And they looked at him and said, no, this is invasive. That's in the body. Only a doctor can do this. You're going to have to do this. I know this is a little gross. I understand. So they bring him like three aprons. (laughs) And the, the gloves and the mask. And the mask was more for what he was about to encounter. Okay? And as he's going and doing what nobody else was wanting or willing to do, while he's in the middle of procedure, he hears the gasp of relief from the elderly woman. As he's doing this unthinkable job of cleaning out her bowels, he hears her say, oh, Thank you so much. And God speaks to him in the moment. He said, that is what serving is. He says, when you're willing to get messy for others' relief, that's when you know you have my heart to serve. See, that's the place. What does giving look like? Giving isn't just putting some money in an offering plate. Giving is when you and I are willing to get a little messy in order to bring relief to people in their life. Did you hear me? Jesus was willing to get a little messy to show his disciples. In fact, he was willing to get a lot messy to show all of us a love that isn't moved by people's mess. It's moved so that people can be relieved. Are you with me? What does giving look like? What does giving look like? It means giving people a hand up. Being willing to help somebody up. With that said, stand with me. All throughout the day.
Now, I'm not going to preach this message. It's a message for another day. Serving does not mean handouts. Okay, I'm going I'm to make this statement really clear, and then I'm going to move on. God, throughout his word, never gave handouts. What God always did was give a hand up. Someone who isn't willing to help themselves can only fall to a place where, and, and fall until they get to a place where they're willing to help themselves. Oh. Someone who is willing to climb out of the hole that they are in or to, to go to a, a better place, that is who God is looking for, for you and I to reach out to. Amen. It's another message. But God never gave handouts. But he was constantly giving hand ups. Let me show you a quick illustration. This group of teenagers went to this, this church camp, and part of the church camp, it was in Colorado, was to fi- climb this mountain that's 14,000 feet high. There's only one in Colorado. It was a part of their bonding and a part of their discipleship, was as one unit to climb this mountain. Pastor Thomas, you might want to use this someday. Uh, I don't, we ain't got no 14,000 uh, foot mountain. Uh, I guess the highest thing in, the, in Lowndes County is the trash heap, so you can go do that. I don't know. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't do that. But about halfway up, one of the students is exhausted. Several students are ahead of him and several are behind him. But he, this kid sits down on, on a rock about halfway up and with dogged determination says, I can't go no more. I'm, I'm wore out, dude. I can't, I can't climb the rest of the way. Several students go past him. And he, uh, he looks at the, the teacher and says, as soon as everybody gets past me, I'm going to go on back down. And the teacher looks at him and said, oh, no. Oh, no. We're, if, if you go down, all of us have to go. I can't leave you by yourself. If you go down, I'm calling all the students back, and we all got to go back. And there was another group of students, three young men, that heard the teacher said that, say that. And they said, you know, I want to get to the top. Man, I, I really want to see what it looks like at the summit. I hadn't worked this hard to get to where I'm at to just go back down. But the teacher says, in order for me to get up there, I got to help him get up there. Oh, y'all hear me? Well, they still got 7,000 feet. So they sit down with this young man, these three guys sit down and said, let's work out a strategy. We'll climb about 30 feet at a time, and then we'll take a break. We'll cl- take, and you just tell us how long you need, but we're going to stay with you, but we're going to climb as much as, it, as you can handle at a time, and then we'll take a break. And they got within a thousand feet of the top, and the last thousand feet is almost straight up. And he looks at him and says, I can't do it, y'all. I'm exhausted. Tony, come here. Fred, come here. Y'all come here. Stay right here. One of y'all, right here. So this is the plan that they devised. One of them grabbed him on this arm. The other one grabbed him on this arm. And one of them got behind them in the backside. And for a thousand feet straight up the mountain, they pushed that young man up the hill. There were 400 students at the top. And when they saw the young man come uh, 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 up to that final step, all 400 of them stood and, and gave that young man a standing, gave the young man a standing ovation because he wouldn't quit. They didn't, give, they didn't give the helpers a standing ovation. They gave the young man because he wouldn't quit. But he wouldn't have made it there if there wasn't three guys carrying him up, pushing him to the top. But I want you to understand, those three guys, guess what they got to see? The top of the mountain. They got to see the top of the mountain. And so did the kid who didn't think he could make it. That is what giving is all about. 
is when you and I are willing to do what is hard to do, when we get behind others who don't think they can make it and say, hey, there's higher heights to go, there's new places to go, and if you don't feel like you got enough strength to get there, come on, bub, I'm going to help you get to the top, and when you get there, I'm going to be there with you. That is a hand up. That's what God, thank you guys. That is what God is asking us to do. Guys, in this church, there's people who are in places, they don't know if they can go another step. Find somebody, give them a hand up. Be a phone, a person they can call when they gotta have help. Be a brother or sister that'll pray with them until they get past what they're facing. Be that friend that is there for them when they're struggling and they want to go back and say, oh no, you done made it here, brother. We're going to make it to where God is calling us to go. That is what giving is all about. That's what serving is all about. Why is this so important? The Bible says this. Look at me. Don't miss this. Because some of you are saying, Pastor Brad, that sounds like a lot of work. And in the Word, he says, those that would be great would be serving of all. Yeah, that don't sound real great to me. That sounds like a lot of work. It is a lot of work. That's why most people don't do it. Let me rephrase that. That's why a lot of Christians don't do it. A lot of Christians just want to come to the table and get fed and go home. Oh, I didn't say that out loud, did I? Did I say that out loud, Tony? A lot of believers want to come in there and, and, and get fed and, whew, boy, that was a great service. Boy, I feel filled up. That was wonderful, man. Woo, Pastor Matt led us right to the table today. Pastor Brett gave us a little bit on the plate. Man, that was good. Now, I'm going back to my world. Am I preaching okay today? Is that, is that not true? What God says is no, serving makes us great. Why? How does it make us great? We, are you with me? Here's, here's how serving, how does this make us great? I want you to know we know him most when we serve like he did. You think you get close to God in worship and you do? <laughs> Pastor Matt, we do. In the presence of God, we get close to God. But you want to know how you can go to another level with God? You start serving the world like he served the world. Yeah. Loving sacrificially, loving sacrificial action is the truest measure of his love through us. But I want you to see what it does. It also activates the deepest and most rewarding part of his love in us. As I was standing there watching all those people grab those hoodies and those coats and watching our people serve them. As a pastor, I didn't tell nobody except I think a couple people, I stood back and I literally felt the deepest presence of God that I had felt in a long time. Watching people give of themselves and the, and the change that it was having on those people who were feeling that kind of love was unreal. The Bible says this in Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 8. It says, but a gener generous man devises generous things, and by generos generosity he shall stand. I want you to see, it ain't just that we feel and experience God in a deeper way, that you and I, but when we begin to serve, it makes us almost immovable. Our generosity plants us in a place where we're not motivated by the selfish things of this world. We're not motivated by the things, the glamour, the, the positions. All we're motivated, God, who can I show love to? God, who can I tell the world that you love them today? Who, and when you do that, you and I are st uh, 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 become, become st uh, uh, so strong in our stance that the enemy can't move us because the things of this world loses their luster. Isn't that what draws most Christians away? The enemy entices us with the luster of this world. Oh, but if you're giving it away anyway, as God gives it to you, you're giving it away. Those things can't draw you away from the heart of God. Last thing, last thing, it opens the door for greatest impact. I want us to read this as our closing statement. 
Isaiah 58, verses 6 through 9. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of the wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? And that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out. When you see the naked, that you cover him and hide yourself and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your then you see this, then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. I want y'all to see this. Serving, serving doesn't reduce your impact. It enables it. It doesn't reduce your authority or minimize your power. It channels it to places and people that need it the most. Me being humble does not minimize my authority. Me serving does not reduce my power. It accentuates it. It channels it to the places that God will direct to have the greatest impact. Why does serving make us great? Because we touch God in his heart. We remove ourselves from the luster of the world. And because God can flow through us to have the greatest impact on the world. He wants us to serve. Did you hear me, church? He wants us to serve. And that's what we're going to do. Anybody with me? Anybody with me? This is what I'm asking. I'm simply calling it one act. One act. I, I thought about writing out possibilities, but God said, no, I want you to leave it in the hands of my people. Let them pray. Let them think and pray for themselves. Are you ready? One act. This is what I'm, I'm asking us as a church to do. Through, especially through the month of January, but I hope you I'm asking you and I to do one act a week, one act a week of sacrificial serving. Just one, 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 one act a week. That means going out of your way to bless somebody. One, going out of your way to help somebody. Just one act a week. And watch what God will start doing on the inside. Second, we'll tell you what it is next week because I'm praying about it and we'll talk about it as a staff. We're going to do one act this month like we did in December. One act where we come together and we bless our community. Where we give, where we serve. We, we find a place of need and we pour ourselves into it as a church. And we're going to see God do incredible stuff. That means he's going to believe, isn't he? God, I pray you would 
will do something special in our heart as a church. You have already started the work. Lord, we're truly we are known by the love we show to the world around us, by the way we give to those who are God, I pray today, let the culture of the gospel be our culture. God, I receive guys, I'm Pastor Brett. I hope you enjoyed either watching or listening to the service and message today. We want you to know that we're excited that you joined us and you are truly an answer to prayer. We have prayed that God would open the doorway for us to share his word and his message with people and you have answered that prayer today. We also want you to know that your needs are important to us and that we're praying for those needs on a weekly basis. No matter where you are, uh, we want you to know we want you to be a part of the Isaiah City family. Uh, if that's through continually watching online or coming and being a part of the service here at our physical location, we want you to be a part of our family. If you want to learn more about who we are or just watch more services and messages, stop by our website, myisaiahcity.com. You can visit us also on Facebook, Instagram, and or YouTube, or you can download our app. Either way, we want to continually connect with you. We love you. We're praying for you. God bless.